warm evening in the summer of 1971, and Steven Spielberg is sitting by the window in his Los Angeles home, watching the world go by. As the sun sets, casting an orange glow through the window of his apartment, Stephen pictures a faraway desert world with two suns and a lone figure staring into the wide horizon. Soon, his imagination starts racing and an entire universe materializes in his mind, a universe of strange worlds, creatures, religions and epic battles of good and evil. His mind is ablaze with ideas and he grabs the nearest pen and paper to capture it all before it slips away. It quickly becomes a space adventure of incredible proportions and it could be huge, he thinks. But Stephen is just a newbie with no real reputation or funds, and the space race is long over, the moon is conquered, maybe nobody cares about space anymore. And maybe he hasn't got the necessary Hollywood clout to carry it off yet. Would they laugh him out of the building? And so the project is shelved, for now. Skip to 1974. The Sugarland Express is a critical success, and young Stephen wins high acclaim at the Cannes Film Festival. He now has three potential plans in the pipeline. Jaws, a psychological thriller about a great white shark that terrorizes a tourist beach. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a thoughtful, poignant science fiction piece about first contact. And finally, his space adventure. Kind of the odd one out, he thinks to himself. The concept is so vast, the universe so huge and unwieldy. What to do? Later that year, Stephen holds a meeting with composer John Williams, puppeteer Jim Henson, and special effects and animatronics guru Stan Winston. Together they sit down and try to figure out how to get away with making this movie. After several hours, they come up with a solution. Spielberg directs, Williams makes the music, but Henson and Winston face a bigger challenge. In order to avoid a potential career suicide, Stephen enlists their help in creating an entirely new persona with which to make this movie. A name, a face, a personality for the blame to fall on if it all goes horribly wrong. No self-respecting director would ever have gone for it. So Henson and Winston design and build a life-size and almost lifelike robot. Capable of performing simple social duties such as interviews, press conferences and so on, as long as the animatronics manipulating his body are always concealed behind a table or pedestal or inside a high-backed armchair. The results are fantastic. He looks almost real. Now all he needs is a memorable name, an everyman name, but iconic and able to sit nicely on a film poster. After much debate, they decide on the name George Lucas. 1976, production is underway on what has become known as Star Wars, and Stephen is hard at work jetting between the Tunisia location and the Close Encounters shoot in Wyoming, where he is working as himself. The George Lucas robot is wheeled around, appearing in production stills which will later appear in coffee table books if the franchise proves successful. All is going to plan. Filming finishes, and Star Wars A New Hope enters post-production. The Lucas droid now spends most of its time in storage, as the team is no longer working in the open. It looks as though they might just get away with this. In 1977, the movie opens, and the reception is rapturous. Star Wars is everywhere. The cinema queues stretch round the blocks, and everyone is clamoring to see this incredible new phenomenon from unknown director George Lucas. The droid has fooled them, and the plan has worked like a dream. Work immediately starts on the following two movies, and the same process is repeated. The Lucas droid appears from time to time, soaking up the adulation of fans and critics alike. By the time Return of the Jedi is released in 1983, everybody involved is a millionaire. The original Lucas droid, warm and rusty, its task now completed, is decommissioned, and a number of newer, simpler models are built for public face. One of these models is even seen to be working alongside Steven himself, entirely out in the open, on an animated dinosaur feature called The Land Before Time, and then subsequently the Indiana Jones trilogy although Harrison Ford, to our knowledge, was never let in on the secret. But unbeknownst to them, away from the limelight, deep within a locked-up Los Angeles prop hangar, the original Lucas droid is still working. For 15 long years, the robot lies undisturbed, but teeming with malfunctions, corrupting and corroding its original commands and breaking its core programming. It is becoming self-aware. 
There, in that hangar, it concocts a horrifying mangled caricature of the vision Stephen had originally built into it. Hideous mechanical plot devices, lengthy Trade Federation disputes, slapstick aliens with alarming racist undertones, excruciating dialogue featuring the use of sand as a metaphor for love, and an infuriating repetition of the arbitrary catchphrase, I've got a bad feeling about this, whenever its rusty circuits cause it to stutter and stall. The Lucas droid breaks free of its shackles and of its own free will, walks straight into the 20th Century Fox main offices. Without Spielberg, Henson or Winston at the controls, it pitches, independently, three entirely new Star Wars films. Imagine that. And of course, the studio officials rub their hands with glee. Come 1997, production is in full swing on Star Wars The Phantom Menace, when Steven gets wind of it. Horrified, he flies from the set of Saving Private Ryan to LA to stop this disaster in its tracks. But even he can't get close. It's a highly secretive operation and a closed set. He tries to contact Winston, but he is hard at work on Jurassic Park 2, The Lost World, and is unreachable. And the only other man who knew how to control the Lucas droid, Jim Henson, died of pneumonia in 1990. Coincidence? Yes. And so the Lucas droid plows on. Spielberg can do nothing but watch in horror as his beloved creation is trashed by the very foil he employed to save his skin. The terrible years roll on. Critics hate it. Fans are outraged. Jar Jar Binks happened. The Clone Wars happened. The moment at the end of Revenge of the Sith at which Darth Vader cries. That happened too. Until in 2012, Steven decides he can take it no longer. Yoda is advertising mobile phone networks on the London Underground. Not even the Ewoks stooped so low. With a lump in his throat, Stephen decides to call in the big guns. What is left to do when all else has failed you? The answer is plain. You phone Disney. On the phone to Disney CCO John Lasseter, Stephen, to his shame, recalls the entire sordid story. How he forfeited his dream, sacrificed everything and entrusted the fate of his masterpiece to an android designed to protect him. But Disney is a forgiving lord. Lasseter knows it could break him. After he has worked so hard to turn it all around after the 80s had brought us the fox and the hound. But if anything is worth staking everything on, it's the original Star Wars trilogy. We all remember where we were on the day that Luke Skywalker found out that Darth Vader was his father and John Lasseter was not about to let that moment die. In a record-breaking $4.05 billion buyout, Disney seized Star Wars from the demented Lucas droid and threw the malfunctioning remains, buzzing and sparking, into a secure, top-secret facility. So consider this. If you have a dream, it is your right and your duty to stand tall. Seize that dream. Make it your own and bask when it comes to fruition. Don't do what Stephen did and hide behind a mask to avoid the cold glare of criticism. For remember, you don't want that mask to take over and become who you truly are. Oh, and one last thing. I know you're angry, but don't go seeking revenge on the Lucas droid. For that is perhaps the greatest tragedy of all. It knows nothing of the damage it has done. And besides, you might get hurt. I hear security's pretty tight at Area 51. <laughs> 